This week's episode is sponsored by HIF Kitchens, the number one online kitchen supply company in Scotland, where you can buy your whole kitchen online with all the prices on show, no gimmicks, just straightforward good deals for high quality kitchens and appliances. You can buy your kitchen from the comfort of your own home instead of getting pestered by pushy salespeople. Check out HIF Kitchens, the number one online kitchen supplier in Scotland. These were known as the Ocean, Ocean the Loving Gang. These were doing heists up to five million quid. You spent 16 years in prison yourself. You went to Grendon and you were living amongst serial killers, child killers, rapists, nonces. I was working with a couple of Serbian guys and a Yugoslavian fella. Uh, and one of them went out one night and got shot. He was on a deal, got shot in the eye and he got killed. And my other pal got shot in the back and, got, and he got crippled. And luckily I was supposed to be there with him that night. And I thought, fuck this, I'm going back to England. I then moved into this relationship because there was celebrities, there was, a, a, you know, nice houses, there was lovely cars and everything. And, but their whole relationship was built on cocaine. Yeah. And I can always remember sitting in prison watching the Ocean's Eleven style heists. And I thought, well, that'd be great if I got out and got a little team together, got some police uniforms, a dog, you know, and actually just go into places with warrants and actually do it right. Uh, so I came out. Um, I got involved in a, in, a, in a few things to raise some capital. And then I got some vans, some cars, some ID, some uniforms, and then we went to work. Ben, we're on. Today's guest, we've got notorious London bank robber, Terry Ellis. How are you, brother? I'm fine. I'm uh, doing great at the moment. Yeah, good. You sent me your book, Living Amongst Beasts. Yeah, we've... Uh... Um, a very powerful book. You were known as the Ocean, Ocean the Loving Gang. You were doing heists up to five million quid. You spent 16 years in prison yourself. You went to Grendon and you were living amongst serial killers, child killers, rapists, nonces, amongst the most nasty people in the world. But you've done that to make changes yourself. And even though we'll touch on all the other stuff that you've done, you've made some massive changes now to better your life, write books, help the youth. You're very anti-gun, anti-knife. You're trying to make changes with so many different people, so fair play to you. So how are you, brother? Yeah, it's, 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 been, a, it's been four years since I got out. Um, well, I've, I seem to have done more in this four years than I've done a lifetime of, of being a criminal. Uh, it's been the most rewarding four years. Um, and, and the book is a combination of, of everything I've gone through um, and actually coming out the other side and, and just becoming a more, more rounded person, person who's able to cope with uh, the everyday life and, and function on a completely different level, uh, alcohol free, drug free. Statistically, I'm not the person uh, the system expected me to be. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, living, I'm living a really happy life. That's a beautiful thing, yeah, isn't it? I'm, 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 I've got my little dog here. Yeah. I'm great. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy. So, I always go back to the start with my guests, yep. where they grew up and how it all began. Yeah, um, I'm, from, as I, as I, I'm from Camden Town. Um, I come from a single parent family, mum. Um, my mum had a few issues uh, when we were younger. Um, she, I think, mean, you know, a few mental problems. Um, she was a professional shoplifter. Um, so my, my first... Um, memories of, of being young was was really just going to the shops with her um, and then watching her take things and, and put them away um, and, and encouraged me to do the same you know when I was walking around um, so 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 for many years I, I thought it was actually normal to take exactly what we wanted um, when I was about 10 I uh, started going out with my friends um, and where I lived in Camden Town, we, uh, we've got loads of, there's a canal that runs from King's Cross to all the way through, uh, up, up to Watford. And along there is a loads of uh, warehouses. So at a very early age, I, I realised that it was okay to go out and take exactly what I wanted. So we used to break into all the warehouses. 
you know, as a 10 year old, I used to go out at 10, 11 o'clock at night and I'd be working all night, nicking gear. We'd break into uh, jean warehouses, you know, toy warehouses, comic warehouses, you name it, we broke into it. And then I would bring it home to my mum, she would sell it and then everything would be great. She would then wake me up in the night and she'd say, I, I found a place that uh, maybe you could help me. And she'd wake me up if you wouldn't tell my brothers or sisters. And then uh, we'd go there and she'd put me through a window and I'd spend all night passing gear out to her. Um, it was crazy because when I actually got nicked doing things, my mum used to come down there and my dad and they'd give me an idea. Uh, but when I used to get away with it, they used to praise me. So from a very early age and from everyone I knew was out there doing the same thing, it was actually okay to take anything you wanted, but if you got caught, you're you're a, you're a wrong one. Yeah, you know, you're going to get an eye in. So, so for me, you know, understanding that now, you know, I realised what a what dysfunctional family I had and what dysfunctional upbringing I, I had at that time. Um, I I then woke up one one day at age eleven. Um, I, you know, I, I had trouble at school. I, you know, I just couldn't learn like other kids. I, I, I got dyslexia, but I didn't realise it at the time. Um, so what I did, that, that gave me a bit of embarrassment, quite a lot of embarrassment. Um, so what I used to do, I used to exclude myself from the classroom. I used to be disruptive. This then had a knock-on effect because I got expelled from school at 11. And then uh, my mum knocked on my door one morning and said, like, we're going down to look at something. Uh, she got a bag and then... Uh, I ended up uh, going to this, this place in Swiss Cottage and uh, I didn't realise at the time it was actually a home. And she said, go there and I'll pick you up later. And that was it. And that was, a, that was really, for me, the start of the decline of my me. Mm -hmm. Because the person I loved more than anything in the world, who I'd give anything to, who I'd, I'd saved and, and given everything for, you know, had left me on the doorstep to, uh, to be to be cared for by people I didn't know. How people. old were you? I was 11 years old. So you were 11? Yeah. You were, and then you realised yeah. your mum didn't want you anymore, basically. Yeah. Did you become then rebellious, angry, oh, was full so of angry, hate? Yeah. You know, I tried to escape that night. You know, I got an hiding um, by the staff. He was supposed to look after me. And that's when I realised that adults weren't the people I thought. Up until that time, I've never been hit by an adult. My dad had given me a right-hander, he'd give me a belt. Well, up until that time, I've never been hit by an adult. Um, so for me, it was it was actually a, it was a wake up call that now I can't trust anyone. I can't trust the people that, that say they love me, and I can't trust adults who are looking after me. Um, I spent I spent a, a few months there, um, and then I, I I had a I had a fight with a couple of guys in there, and I whacked one of them across the nut with a chair, and then I was moved from there to a place called Stanford Ass. It was in uh, um, Shepherd's Bush. Now, uh, when I got there, it was just like, they, they called them, there was five dorms or five asses, Hoare, Hamby, Hastings, and a CP, like where for a lot of the really bad kids, they, they were there. So I've gone now, and uh, it, the place is, a, is, a, is like a battleground. There's kids fighting every day, and you have to prove yourself. You know, so I've only been there a, a few minutes, and, uh, and I'm being told that I, I can't sleep there, I've got to sleep there. And I thought, no, fuck it, fuck all that, I'm not. Um, and then I'm, I mean, I'm having a tear up with three or four guys and then they're beating the shit out of me. So I learned very quickly to keep my mouth shut. Um, I was a lot younger than most of the guys there, but I had, I had sort of a way with me that I could actually mix in with anyone. So within a, in a week or so, it was, like, it was like my own, you know? And after about six months, it was like, you know, like I'd never been anywhere else apart from this gaff. You know, all I see was fighting every day you know, the worst sort of kids at 11, 12 years old. And uh, and then I said, I've got to go to a place in uh, in Wiltshire, a place called Greenacres. And it's going to be a place where you're going to live. So I thought, fuck that, I'm off. Um, and then uh, one of the guys grabbed me, one of the staff, and I stabbed him with a fork. And then I was put in the CP, uh, where he was locked up all the time. And I thought, well, at least I've got out of going now. And about a month later, they came in and said, you get in the van, you're going now. So now... I, I, you know, instead of being around my family or my friends and anything else, I'm now taking a hundred miles up the road, you know, and away from everything I know, and I'm putting this in this uh, home for kids. Um, uh, but you know, for me, it was. Uh, I expected my fear of going in was probably worse than actually what it was because I arrived in this this mansion of a gaff, you know, in the middle of nowhere with fields and everything else, 
and um, there was a farm there, um, and I spent the next two years uh, on a farm, you know, just working. They never give me no schoolwork, mm -hmm. uh, they, they, you know, because I was very disruptive. I'm not going to lie. I was, I was, uh, I was one of them kids that just, if I didn't like something, I ain't going to do it. And and so they said, like, you know what? Let's have a compromise. Work on the farm. I work with the animals, you know. Um, and then I, I unfortunately, I, I there was a couple of the girls there that I knew because um, it was a mixed home. And I ended up having a relationship with one of them and having a kid. And I think I was about 14 then. Yeah, you got to get all plagued at 14. Yeah, you get yeah. kicked out? They kicked me out to London, yeah. They kicked me out. Mm -hmm. um, I then came back to London and the social services couldn't do nothing with me. Uh, they couldn't put me anywhere. Couldn't go back to my family. And so they put me in a flat. I think I was about 15 then. And uh, there was two other guys living in this flat. Older, they in their 20s. And... Uh, you know, they were drinking, taking drugs and everything else. So I had a room now and, I was, and, and uh, they, gave me, they gave me money to, to cancel. So I just lived there every week. I think it was about 50 quid. So I had to get my shopping. I was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, you know, fuck it, I made it. I'm cracking. I'm living on my own anyway. I'm back in London. And But these, these guys I was living with, they were actually uh, going out doing robberies, doing post offices, building societies and, and uh, the other stuff. And uh, I was quite a big kid then. I was, I was doing trampoline and boxing because my dad was a my dad was a boxer. So we always done a lot of training as kids. And um, they offered me to come with them, and, and uh, we sort of just started doing loads of robberies, you know, bank uh, post office mostly, you know, going in there straight through the hatches and finding different ways to actually, you know, do post office and everything. You know, I, was, I used to wait for, for them to come in in the mornings. I used to catch them going in. I used to go through windows, tape them up. Um, and I thought, well, God, I've, I've, I've actually found something I'm good at. At 15? 15 years old. Coming on to 16, I found, I found something that I can actually excel at simply because I had everything. I had, all my, I had money. I had, I had nice clothes. I had a nice girlfriend at the time. And, uh, and, I, and I went from having nothing to having a rent in a place out in Amsterdam. Yeah. So I gave you a bit of authority, a bit of power, a bit of respect. Something that you never had for yeah. all those years yeah. that nobody wanted you. Suddenly, people wanted your attention. Well, you know what? You know, it's, you that know, becomes an addiction as well, oh, yeah. doesn't it, Terry? Do you know what? It's, it was. Um, I don't think you know. I don't think people. Uh, I don't expect to appreciate. That's probably the wrong word. I don't think anyone can understand that that, that feeling of going in somewhere and just 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 doing what I used to do. You know, it was quite. It was, you know, you got the adrenaline rush, the dry mouth. Um, but it was just, it was just different, you know, like, you know, it was, and plus I, I, it was the only thing I knew, you know, I couldn't get a job. I couldn't, you know, I didn't want a job. I was, you know, as a criminal, I was just lazy. You know, most criminals that I know are lazy. We don't want to go work nine till five. So we, we do the thing that we like. And, and unfortunately, I, I, I like doing robberies. Mm -hmm. What was the turning point when you came through your teenage years when you started getting into the heavier stuff? I think for me, it was getting nicked. <laughs> so you done six no. years in the YOs? No, yeah, I got, I got um, what I did, I got nicked. Um, I remember, you know, I was going, I was sailing through this period of doing robberies as a, as a, as a 16 year old kid. And then uh, I went home, I rented a place out, I went home one day and all of a sudden the, the whole, the whole house came alive with old Bill. You know, next thing I got a whack in the head, kicking the bollocks. I was spread eagled on the floor. And then, and then, you know, all, all, I, all I, we've got him, and they said, don't, don't fucking move. And that was the first time ever that I actually realised this wasn't a game. I mean, up until that moment, I thought it was a game. You know, I was robbing, it was a laugh and everything else, but the reality then kicked in. And then, a, a, you know, a month later, I'm sitting inside, I'm sitting inside Aylesbury Prison uh, with some hardened kids, you know, like, you know. And uh, I just got, I think I just got four years in as a seven-year-old kid, you know. Um, but, you know... I networked, I met some really interesting people and I came out um, and then I went, in, I went on, the, on the jump ups. You know, I started just nicking bands, you know, following them around. Um, and then got a, I got a look at, you know, I got, uh, we, we, done, we done a few things, we nicked quite a, quite a lot of money and uh, the old bill came on us. So I fucked off to Spain uh, when I was about 21. Um, in that period, I'd also got married I'd had a kid, I'd separated from her. I felt very, uh, you know, I felt, I felt, 
I felt alienated for the fact that I, I, I just fucked up the relationship simply because I couldn't control my temper. I couldn't control my womanizing. I couldn't control my drinking. I found myself in Spain thinking, I don't really give a fuck now if I get nicked. You know what? I'm just gonna just gonna take it as it goes. And luckily, I you know I knew some people that put me in touch with some people over there, and I started running puff up. You know, from Marbella, I was picking up the beach. Hash. Yeah, um, and I was packing it. You know, vacuum sealing it. You know, dipping it in um, bleach and in coffee, and then I was putting it in the car, and then I was driving up to Valencia. <laughs> Um, you know, and there's three of us, you know, one in, one in front, one behind, the normal routine, mobile phones back in the day. Um, and yeah, I didn't care. I just wanted, I didn't, you know, so I, I used to go through this thing in my head. You know, if I got caught, fuck it, you know, I didn't care. So, but because I was on that suicide mission, I, you know, I'd done, I'd done quite a few runs. I, I never got caught, mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, I'd done it for a few years. And unfortunately, one of, one of my, one of the guys I was working with, he went off a cliff. Um, unfortunately, he died. Um, so I, 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 had to, I had to fuck off a bit sharpish. Um, and then I went to Amsterdam. You know, I was over there for a little while, a couple of years. Met some really interesting people. Um, you know, and I had contacts in England, contacts over there. And everything was going great. I had a little place over there. I was, you know, in a fucking speedboat in you know, uh, Utrecht. And I was mixing with some really great, good people, going to, you know, all houses every night. Uh, having good restaurants, and I thought I'd cracked it. I was working with a couple of Serbian guys and a Yugoslavian fella, uh, and one of them went out one night and got shot. He was on a deal, got shot in the eye, and he got killed. And my other pal got shot in the back and, got, and he got crippled. And luckily, I was supposed to be there with him that night. And I thought, fuck this, <laughs> I'm going back to England. You know, so I came back to England, and uh, I'd, met, I'd met a few contacts over there, and they introduced me to some, some people over here that could supply me with as much cocaine as I wanted. So I spent, I spent the next, I don't know, seven, eight years just giving that cocaine Supplying. like it was confetti. Yeah. You know, do, yeah. But seeing you were doing coke, did you stop the bank jobs? Did you stop Yeah, else? yeah. When I came out, I, I was doing the jump ups and then we went and I was selling gear. I'm doing the gear, I went into the drug game. Um, everything was going really well. Uh, we were doing five, 10 key every, every other day. And and uh, one day was was a was a day I never forget. It was at nine eleven. Remember nine eleven when the tower blocks yeah. went up. Um, we was all watching the telly, and my mate was supposed to pick up ten key that morning. So we let, he left it in 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 the plot where we leave all our gear, and um, he phoned me the next morning and said, "Listen, um, I'm fucked till we got to drop that ten key off." And I said, well, I phoned everyone. No one wants to fuck all. Only one of my pals had phoned me and said, tell, I'm desperate for two, two, two bits. So I, so I said, all right, I won't bring everything. I'll pick up the two. And I went down to meet him. I'll give him the, I'll give him the two key. And, and uh, next thing I know, he's going to a block of flats down the Angel. And the next thing, the fucking old streets has come alive with old Bill. Like traffic wardens, two traffic wardens, a uh, post office guy. Because I remember looking at these guys thinking... They, 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 you they, just, look, they, yeah. they just look a bit funny yeah, you just, and they yeah. was all getting closer and closer and all of a sudden the fucking the windows are coming uh, I'm being dragged out on the floor and I'm thinking well you know what I've got fuck on me is that set up? Um, well you know what the guy that I was dealing with was a bit of a prat um, he actually instead of going and dropping the stuff off to where he should have gone he'd gone into his own flat I didn't know it was his own mm -hmm. flat now and he'd gone up and, and took uh, about 11 wraps out of it apparently and then brought it down. So as I was getting spread eagle on the floor, dirty bollocks came out the fucking door and they got him, me with the gear as well. You know, I was, I was seen giving it to him, but when they got up to us, he was gone. They was a little bit pissed at that. That's why they came into the car heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, but now they got him. There's no fingerprints on it from me because it's a Hessian bag. Uh, and I'm thinking, you know what, I'm not even a, I'm not even gonna get a time here because they know what I'm at. It's all I'm doing is sitting in the car. And unfortunately, you know, he then said, uh, I'd give him the Hessian bag with the gear in. So, Stop again? Yeah, he 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 had already just he just came from doing twelve years, which I didn't know. Um, so if, you know what, I end up getting six years um, for being in possession of some gear. But luckily for me, the gear came back at really shit percentage. So I got done for one key. Uh, I got six years, so I wasn't too bad. Mm -hmm. um, I can remember sitting here that evening because two nights before I was at with Kate Moss, Jude Law. Sadie Frost at a party. I, mean, I think I was in her ass, and 
you know, I think the house was worth about ten million pound, and I was thinking, and then the next minute, I'm sitting in this at, in in a in a prison cell in Pennonville, <laughs> and there's all graffiti like fucking Peter was here, mm -hmm. and I'm looking around this cell, Mum and Jack, it's all fucking cockroaches everywhere, Pennonville, if you know Pennonville, and uh, I'm just thinking my life has just gone shit now, and, you know, I know I know what's coming, I know that I'm gonna lose my ass, I'm gonna lose all my money, and and the relationship with my kids is gonna go Pete Tong. Simply because I ain't gonna be able to see him for the next four years or five, yeah. whatever it's gonna be. What was Kate Moss like? She was really nice as I was really down to earth. Yeah. Um, I met her quite a few times. Um, they were just really nice people. Um, my girlfriend uh, was uh, Sadie Frost's sister, Sunshine Frost. I believe or not, it's a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> um, but yeah, they were really nice people. Mm. Um, really good uh, company. Um, I met Dave Bourne, who was their dad. He's the guy that actually painted all the, the Rolls Royces for the, um, for the what is it called, the, the Liverpool band, the, the Beatles, uh -huh. um, for years ago. So, you know, he was a character. They was all characters, you know. I met um, Sean McGregor. I went to Sean Pertry's uh, wedding. That was a great experience, and meeting all them. And just really just, you know, it was, it was actually just like us, you know. I used to go yeah. ice skating, go to the theatre. Um, no one knew what I was about. You know, because at that time we had a courier company, me and my pals. So they thought I was a courier at a courier company, and uh, everything was sweet. You know, we had I was having a really good life, and in the meantime, I, I had another separate life selling this gear. Um, and then, that, then, as I said, uh, you know, and then that evening I'm sitting in this in the cell after spending three or three days in the police, uh, police station, and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, fuck, it's all gone there. Everything's mm -hmm. gone. Everything I I have built up is gonna go, because um, as criminals we uh we have a warped sense of uh, fair play. As I told you, yeah. you know, now they they're gonna take everything that I've nicked off me, you know, which is funny. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, you know, for me, I, I you know I put it to bed straight away. I wasn't gonna worry about it. I knew they was gonna take my ass. I knew they was gonna take my money. I knew my girlfriend was gonna take her ass. I, you know, we was we were both in that, but it was in her name. So I knew that from that day forward, I was on my jack, and yeah. and it was I was on my own. Yeah. You know? So you get done with proceeds, lost everything, lost, lost everything. your girlfriend, lost everything. Yeah. yeah, you know, within a space of six months, she was gone. I think the, the you know relationship was based on cocaine. Of course, but the relationship on, you, yeah. you get used because yeah. if I, I always say, and it might sound crazy for people, but everything's frequencies and energies. If you're doing gear, if you're robbing stuff, you're a low vibrational person where you're attracting all these other wannabes, other people with leeches, and when that shit goes, they go. I think there's, a, there's definitely a price to be paid for being a criminal. Of course you know, there is. If, if you live that life, if you've got a wife and kid, you know, we all we all come up as criminals and we make really nice girls and we have well, they have expectations of us and they have expectations of, of me. We have a few kids. We, we, we make a nice home. And you know everything that we say we are, we're doing for you, the kids and that. We then going out every night on the piss. We're meeting girls. We're we're taking drugs. Yeah. So what started as something good and honourable then turns into something really shit. Yeah. And that's what and I and I found myself doing. I lost. I you know I left my I left my girlfriend. I then moved into this relationship because there was celebrities, there was a, a, you know nice houses, there mm -hmm. was lovely cars and everything and. But their whole relationship was built on cocaine. Yeah. But yourself, Terry, going through the life you've been through, the abandonment, your mum passing you away. So it doesn't matter how much money you had, how big your house was, how big a celebrity it was, because you had that fear of they're going to leave me. Yeah. So after maybe three months down the line, you'd have jeopardised that anyway. With the cheating, you'd have had something. They're going to leave me anyway. So I'll fuck them up first yeah. kind of mentality. I think I think for me, I, I you know, I think because I, I had lots of addictions. I had sex addiction. I had coke addiction, <laughs> fucking drink addiction, you know, and yeah. even a robbery addiction, yeah. I can imagine. But you know, because I, ne I, I could never ever, you know, get my, you know, get my head around it because I never couldn't deal with it. Um, um, for me, I just, uh, you know, I just couldn't. I had lots of girls because if I had an argument with one of them, then I could move straight to the next one. Yeah. Even if I had a, a long time girlfriend, mm -hmm. I'd have three or four in the wings. Because I couldn't, you know, yeah, when you talk about abandonment, yeah. we I'm not prepared to have an argument and sort out a problem as a criminal. Because what I do, I, I have an argument with her and I say, oh, well, fuck you, or and I'll mm -hmm. see you later and I'll go to this one. Yeah. I spend all day there and all night there and I'm being loved, I'm being okay. Yeah. I go back to this one and say, right, listen, if you carry on, I'm going to go. Yeah. She forgives me and then it all starts again. Mm -hmm. 
but I was never in a position. I, I put myself in a position where I could never be yeah. unloved again. Yeah, I was like that. So if I had a girlfriend, there's some nights I would cause an argument so yeah. I could go into the other one so I wouldn't feel as guilty as fucking the other one about. So it was kind of their fault. You caused an argument. It's you, it's pushing me away. Yeah. But really, it's fucking us. It's the wrong ones. Do you know what I mean? And the trouble is, the more you do it, the more you don't learn. Yeah, of course. You know, you actually, mm -hmm. I actually, I actually, for many years thought I was right. I actually thought <laughs> I, was, I was actually in the wrong. You know, and, yeah. and was, anyway, I speak to my ex girlfriend. You know, the only person that gave me somewhere to live when I came out was my ex-girlfriend, mm -hmm. believe it or not. Yeah. She was married to someone else and she actually, because you know, a few things happened doing, doing Grendon and everything else. Um, she actually offered me a, a flat, which is, is, is still touched me to this day. And mm -hmm. she introduced me to my current girlfriend, which is, uh, yeah. which is you, know, you know, good. Yeah. There is know. good people out there. That, that is... She's an exception. Yeah. So when you came out after the six-year sentence for the coke, what happened with your life then? You know what? I, was, I, was, I came out, I was bitter. I was angry, you know, through my prison system, I, I, I had quite a lot of trouble with the screws, you know, um, just couldn't take orders. I spent quite a lot of time in the block. Um, and I just, I was angry. I was angry at them. I was angry at my life. I was angry at losing my girlfriend. I was angry at losing my car, my house, everything. And I was back on the street with nothing. I soon realized that everybody I'd helped out through the years has all moved on. You know, they were now selling the gear that I used to give them. And they weren't going to give me anything because the last thing they want to give is give you an hand up, mm -hmm. you know. So it was about finding something different that I was good at. So I reverted back to, to type. Um, I went back in, uh, into the robbery game. But I spoke to a lot of people in prison and uh, I realised this very quickly that a lot of people were getting shot on eyeballs. So if, you know, so if you were being ready-eyed on a bit of work, and so the minute you turned up, you're going to get shot. Uh, if you take a gun to a, a work, uh, you're going to get shot. Um, and you're also going to get 25 years. So it was about thinking of a new way to earn money. And I can always remember sitting in prison watching the Ocean's Eleven style heists. And I thought, well, that'd be great if I got out and got a little team together, got some police uniforms, a dog, you know, and actually just go into places with warrants and actually do it right. Uh, so I came out. Um, I got involved in a, in a, in a few things to so raise some capital. And then I got some vans, some cars, some ID, some uniforms. And then we went to work. You know, I got, you know, one of my friends, uh, he's six foot four. One of my other pals, ex-army. Uh, another of my, my, you know, my other couple of pals, they're, they're like bulldogs. They're, they're like, you know, they're there. They're our core guys that I can trust. I've known them all my life. Um, so we went in and started just, you know, we put our toes in and, and nicked, you know, cut under ground there. Cut on the ground now. I thought, well, oh, fucking, this is good. And then we started doing doing warehouses, bonded and that. And then uh, we uh, we we uh, came across the Verizon uh, communication centre in King's Cross. Uh, we were told we were told by a lot of firms it was a high risk job and it was probably one that shouldn't be shouldn't be approached simply because there was a police station at Ivory Islet and now there was Kennish Town police station at the other end and uh, there was. Uh, Al Al uh, Albany Street on the other side and behind it there was there was a canal so there's no way out there's only one way in and one way out and it was a rat room for the old bill as well you know they were coming past every five minutes um, so it was deemed you know un you know it was just one of those jobs you can't do so did that entice you in even more that tease you even more that someone says a job couldn't be done so you've kind of got that fuck it I'll show them do you know what? I think because I was so angry, because I, you know, I, had, I still had a lot of resentment for the old Bill. Mm -hmm. You know, one for nicking me. I don't know why. It just is. Um, I actually went out of my way to actually, because I nicked, I nicked uh, the, ID, I nicked everything off the old Bill out of the vans and everything. We went, you know, we got everything. I also done an, a, an ID with, with Darren Brand. That was my thing. You know, the illusionist. Yeah. So I got all the ID done, and then going down there and 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 reading because I read the sites, you know, it's one of them places. It was like Fort Knox, twenty-four hour security, eight security guards, uh, biometric alarm systems, uh, keypads, everything. It had everything. It was, it was in you know air pressure doors, the works. And we thought, how can we do this? And we 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 come up with just uh, a different way that most people were doing things at that time. We went and got ourselves an old station. We bought a couple of vans, a couple of, uh, couple of cars. We we kicked them out. And, and we got the uniforms and we went down there. You know, we had a look at it for a few days and, uh, over, that, over that period. And we realised that the only flaw in the whole system was the fact that they were open, still open that door when people knocked on it. And that was the weak thing. So we went down there, pulled up on, on the... As we walked, believe it or not, when we pulled down there the first time, there was a cop car came behind us, a real old Bill. We was all dressed as old Bill. 
And next thing we looked in, I looked in the wing mirror and, the, and there's a real old bill behind us. And all of a sudden the, the lights went on. And I, I, I always remember that feeling. I looked at my pal and I, I felt my stomach go over. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, fuck, we've got to do this. Cunt. Otherwise you're not going to be able to get out of here. And all of a sudden he's gone round us and he's gone down the road. So we went past the place and we had to drive all the way around again. And in that, that moment, that five minutes it took us, because we had radios, we said, a bolt, a bolt, a bolt. You know what I mean? That's all I heard. Let's get the fuck out of here. And I said, no, no, let's just carry on there. Now we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do this. So, you know, me and my pal was ex-army. He was driving, pulled up onto the curb, pulled up, you know, it was about 40 foot from the curb to the, to the front door. So we pulled onto the pavement, right up to the front door, car pulled by the side of us and the dogs came out and uh, we knocked on the door. You know, and just said like, we believe uh, we've had information received that there's someone up on the roof and uh, we're gonna come in and have a search of the place. And they opened the door and then we walked in now. Um, uh, we took the biggest, the two biggest uh, guys around the corner, and then I said, "Look, we 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 have information that the, the guy that came through is dressed as one of you lot, as a security guard. So for my protection and my officer's protection, I'm going to have to cuff you until I find out who you are." So after a little bit, I, you know, I'm the head of security bollocks. Um, they went, "All right, no problem." So we cuffed them up, <laughs> sat them on the stairs, and then what we did is, when I walked back in, we uh, we just took all the rest of them because there was all there was loads, there was, there was sitting behind the monitors, they monitoring the old gaff. And uh, we just took them out one by one, handcuffed them and done it. Then we got a few uh, maintenance people and then a few cleaners. I think when I look around, I think there was about 16 people on the, on the fucking stairway. Uh, um, and then we said, we're going to take the dog round and, and search the buildings. But, you know, just calm down. You know, it's not, no one's going to get hurt. You know, everything's going to be sweet. And then so we went to work. We, we had one guy on the, on the desk. Um, as I said, we actually went into the wrong room. We actually pulled a, a computer chip out. Uh, uh, which, which turned off all the, another security firm that was looking at it. And then they phoned up and uh, they said, what's going on? We said, there's been a surge in the system and they'll be up and running in another 45 minutes to an hour. And uh, that was that, they put the phone down and uh, we had an hour, we knew we had an hour then. So that bought you more time? Do you know what, yeah, you know, just by being cool and not, not disappearing yeah. and answering the phone, it kept, mm-hmm. it, kept, it kept the job alive. And this was estimated of being a five million pound heist what was it motherboards what is a motherboard a motherboard is like it's like it's like a mainframe computer so if you look at if you look at a, a server in a normal uh, office block that one server can probably do the whole place so if you imagine a server could probably do a whole country so you know these ones these ones are there like they were 32 chips in each one they're worth one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a piece and they got about eight or ten in each server so they can you know if you consider in a phone, you can send something to the, you can send a spaceship. The yeah, same amount of technology, the technology in, that. in the phone, yeah. So the technology in this, apparently, we we uh, we shut down three countries, um, which they weren't happy about. You know, I think it was Morgan, uh, yeah, Morgan, uh, the Morgan uh, Foundation or Stanley, whatever yeah. it is, the bank people. Um, yeah, we shut, you know, we shut down, uh, but we we spent an hour in there. We kept everyone reassured, you know, and then we just went in there, drilled it all off. We kept everyone nice and calm. Brought, you know, I think we had about, about 15 bags, you know, them big washing bags and stuff. And we just walked them out to the van, you know. And then uh, we, I called it and said, like, let's go. And so we took one of the dogs went out. Uh, everyone just went out. And then I, I was the last one out of there. And I, and I looked at, I just, you know, I just shut up, shut the door up. And then uh, and we got in the van and we were gone. Um, uh, it took us about 40, 40 minutes to get to where we was. We went and dumped all the gear, put it all in, in the stash, got rid of the cars, burned them out, burned the vans out. And we met up about one o'clock in the morning. Uh, after we'd done everything, uh, we got rid of all our gear, put it all in bags so we can burn it. And uh, that was the first time we sat down and had a drink and just discussed it. You know, uh, you know, there's a certain bit of camaraderie when you do a bit of work, whether it's counting out money or whether it's doing a job. Uh, but it's also a way to unwind. You have a laugh and a joke and you say, you know, you, you start talking about the job. And then within an hour, you've had a drink, everyone's happy. We know we got the prize and we know we got away with it. But the most important thing, we got away with it without earning anyone, which is great. You know, um, um, yeah, for me, that was, uh, you know, it was a job I'll never forget because it was my birthday the next day. Yeah. I can always remember. And I, you know what? I remember waking up and I got a phone call from, from, my phone didn't stop ringing, believe it or not, from loads of people in the area. And they all kept saying, uh, fucking hell, you heard this? That, that, that Verizon got done last mm-hmm. night. So what do you mean? So I've been I've been asleep. What happened? And so it's, it's like it's foreign firms come over. They're like a Russian firm, 
You know, they've come over here, they're commandos, yeah. and they've done this job. And it's all over the fucking television. It's all over the papers. You know, uh, they call it the Real Ocean's Eleven job. Mm. And I just, just laughed. I thought, you know what? You know, such a life, you know what I mean? I said, fucking hell, good luck to him. Yeah. And the next phone call, the same thing. And then one of my mates uh, phoned me up, Paul. He said, have you heard about his job? He said, it ain't weren't you, was it? So I said, don't be stupid, you <laughs> bastard, you know what I mean? Hey. Anyway, he went on about a few things and that was it. And then I, I jumped in my car and I, and I slipped away. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And I, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was something that I, I didn't How forget. was it from taking motherboards out to seeing real money in a bank job? Was it could because it's weird, isn't it? Seeing that and thinking yeah. that's worth money to actually getting real cash. What was the what I think, was I think, I think for me it's like is when you got money, when you got money, jewelry, and all that, you mm -hmm. it's all there, yeah, you can just chop it up and yeah. you do it, and then you walk home with a parcel, and then it's nice. It's a it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a warm feeling, and it's uh, it's you know, you're part of something, you know, you, you know, it's it's easier, it's clean now, there's no drama. Uh, unfortunately, with motherboards. You now got offences, yeah. so now you 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 optimise your risk of actually getting nicked, because now you got to go to people you don't particularly Destribute. know, yeah, 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 people yeah. that that buy and sell gear really are not as as honourable as what we are. Yeah, unfortunately, we didn't realise at this time that we would pissed off the, the flying squad, we pissed off everybody in the, in yeah. the Scotland Yard, so they then put a seventy strong a strong team on us, but we was we was oblivious to that. Um, it was only it was only um, it was only uh, about a week later, we was actually there was a, there was my friends uh, were doing another bit of graft. Uh, the police came, an officer got what, got banged out, uh, another one got thrown over a wall. Um, my friend got nicked, and then because of that, uh, they then done known associates, and because he had a police uniform on at the time, they then they then showed my picture as a friend to all the security guards. And that was the end. That was the end for me. So they linked it all. Yeah, they said like, "This is the ringleader. This is the guy that done this." And I can always remember I was at, I was at my girlfriend's house, and it was about half. I always get up at half five in the morning. It's a it's a it's a, it's a jail thing. I think yeah, I, you know, when you've been in prison, um, most people get weighed in in the mornings. You know, when the doors open. Yeah. So I always get up early because I seen people getting weighed in with with fucking yeah. socks and everything. I was. Uh, with tuna bottles and everything in it, you know, you know everything. So I always get up early. So it's just this is what I do. And then I looked out the window and then I saw a guy, I saw another guy, I saw a bird, and these were all people I'd never seen before. And they, was, they, were, they, were, dressed, they were just like plain clothes old Bill. So I, I never even told my girlfriend. She was, she was in a bedroom, uh, she had a couple of kids in the ass, and I just I went up on the roof, I was down the road, I went straight across the roof and I had, it was one of these ladders that went down the side of the building. I went down there and I, I jumped about 20 foot down. Um, and then as I walked through, I saw them all going in, all the old bill, about 25 of them. And then, uh, you know, she, she uh, you know, I, I, I spoke to her a week later and she said, fucking hell, man, they just come straight through the ass. They've, they've, they, they knew you were there, blah, blah. So I said, all right, no, just calm yourself down. But I ain't coming back. And that was it. I changed my, got rid of the phone, got rid of her. Um, and I moved up to Dunstable. I met a girl up there, um, started training. Um, I never thought nothing of it. You know, I uh, came down to see the kids. I got a job in a gym training people. And uh, I was living on a canal boat as well. And I also rented out a little cottage. And I was living, a, you know, I was fairly decent lives. I was doing bits and pieces. Um, and all of a sudden, I woke up, uh, I'd come down to London and um, I got off at West Hampstead. I didn't realise at the time that they had all this facial recognition bollocks going on. And it, and it captured my boat and I had a hat on and everything. And uh, even though I was aware of it, all the stuff that has happened, I had a hat. I just thought, you know, a little trip down there ain't gonna, ain't gonna be in a drama. And then um, I came back to Lee Grave, got off there, went back to my little place I was staying in. And, and I, went, I got up and I went and got something to eat. And uh, the whole street just came alive again. You know, like there was that moment again. Mm. But this was different this time for some reason. It was all in slow motion. I was on the phone to my pal down in London, and all of a sudden I saw this car coming towards me and it mounted the pavement and there was a brick wall here. And I said to my mate, fuck, I threw the phone over the wall. And as, as, as he, the car came towards me, and as I turned around, another one came and they smashed it into each other. And they tried to, they tried to take me out from my legs. And then I jumped, up, I jumped up on the bonnet, rolled over, and then the van pulled up. And then all these fucking old Bill got out with uh, balaclavas and just started fucking weighing me in. 
And at first, I actually was was quite uh, yeah, frightened. Thought you were getting took away. Do you know? I thought I was getting kidnapped. Yeah. Do you know? For the first time in my life, I thought I've, I've obviously upset someone, and yeah. uh, and this is it. This is payback. You know what I mean? But then I heard the radios, and then I heard we got him. Fucking, we got him. We got him. And they were clapping themselves and whacking themselves on the shoulders. Is it him? Is it him? And I thought, fucking hell. But I was actually quite relieved. Yeah. You know, there's a relief now that I've actually stopped going on a run. And I went back to the Kentish Town Police Station. I, you know, I never said nothing to them all the way back. And then uh, I got to Kentish Town Police Station. It was my local local police station. And we've never really seen eye to eye meeting the old bill down there. But they actually gave me a round of applause when I came in there. Mm -hmm. You know, they, just, they was all like, ah, we got him. We finally got this prick, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, and they clapped me in and that was it. And you were I, the last to get caught? Yeah, I, was, I got next to uh, about nine months later. And everyone get 10 and 11. Yeah. You got the biggest sentence, 16? 16 years. Nearly 16, 17. Was, yeah. 16, yeah. 9. For being a ringleader. Um, also, I, I, I tried to escape from prison. Um, what happened when you tried to escape? Do you know what? I went, I won, I got pulled out in the production, uh, production order. Uh, so what I did, it took me to Highbury, Highbury Police Station. There was a bit of building work going off there. So they said, moving down to Kentish Town. So I went to Kentish Town. They said, well, you... I had a little chat with them in there, and I said, you know, they, they, they said, uh, you know, if we, we want to talk to you about certain things, but I said, no, I'm not going to talk, fuck, well, you might as well send me back to Pentonville. And they said, but first we want to say, you got to go on an ID parade, you want to take your picture and all that, so we're going to go from here to Tottenham. So I said, all right, coming in, get me, put me handcuffs on. As he put me, as he put his handcuffs on, it, was a, it was a, must have been a rookie cop. He never put them on properly, it was a bit loose. So as I walked out, I could feel it, I could feel it, I thought, you know, if I, if I, if I give this a, a tug, it's going to come off in a minute. So I got in the van. I think there was eight old Bill with me there, a couple in the, in the car in front, three in the back, three with me. And we, we drove to there. And then I can always remember this, this cop was saying, you know what, you're going to go away for a real long time, brother. You know you know what you can do yourself a favour? Tell us about everything. Tell us about all your friends, anything you know. You'll be getting six years, you'll be out in three. I said, you know what, brother? I said, I'll be out tonight. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be out. I'll be home. I'll be, out. I'll be living the life again. And he just said, you, you, you prick. <laughs> so we just we had laughed we just laughed about it and then I went quiet they went quiet and when we got there we pulled into the car park and uh, there was a little voice inside my head saying just fucking do it man go 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 take the handcuffs off and go so I slipped them off and I put it back on again I thought why I just had the you know I needed a bit of luck and I needed just a, mm -hmm. a bit of time to get through this and this, there was this voice in my head kept saying don't do it you know, you know, don't do it. You know, it's not worth the hassle. You know, you're going to get done for GBH. You're going to get done for this. And it's going to be fucking murder. And there's always that voice I've always had was so powerful in my head for years. In the bit that, you know, when I went on a bit of work, you can do this. Just fucking go for it. The same voice was there. And he just said, go for it. Just fucking do it till. So as it just happened, the first car pulled up against the wall. No one got out. The second car pulled up against the wall. No one got out. I thought, lovely. The geezer in front went in, knocked on the door, walked in. I'm left with two, two coppers. And I thought, you know what? I, I don't know if I can open that van door, you know, because I don't want to start whacking them and then I can't get the fucking out of the van because the central locking or something, yeah? Because I was, I was in the back. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the guy behind me started reading the paper and then the guy in front of me, for some fucking reason, he opened the door and stepped down. So I thought, fuck it, the cuffs were off and I went, bam, nuts. You know, I just whacked him on the chin. He's, he's gone on his Aris. And, uh, and I thought, I'm out of here. I've gone down, I've gone round the corner. And just as I got there, three old Bill were coming in through the gate. And they put their hands up and they fucking come after me. So I ran, jumped on a on a car, on a, on a, on a on a bonnet, on a on a roof, on a van, and jumped on the wall. Thought, lovely, I'm out of here now. But as I went over the cuff, I was still on my wrist, got caught on the thing, and I couldn't pull over. And it, it, it just enough time for someone to come up the car, up the van, and jump round my neck. The next thing I knew, I was on the floor between the car and the wall in a load of mud. And they were they they were they were having a little dig at me. You know, they broke my three of my ribs, on my shoulder, and busted my eye. And uh, I was quite fortunate, believe it or not, even though I, was, I, I sustained them, them sort of bruises. Uh, because just at that moment, my, my solicitor came through the door. They had handcuffed me by this time. And uh, he said, what's going on? What the fuck is happening? You know, what's going on? And I said, listen, I've just got out of the van. They just all jumped me. <laughs> I said, I'm handcuffed. Yeah. And they said, no, you tried to escape, blah, blah, blah. And then um, I went back to Pentonville. Um, and then I got put in the patches, you know, the yellow and green, yellow and green stripe. They said I was off key. I went down the block for a week and then I got back on the wing. But while I was down the block, um, you know, I, I, there, was, there was loads of cockroaches in the block. I don't even have been to Pentonville. Obviously, no. you ain't. Um, and a governor came down. And uh, 
I said, look, I can't live in these fucking conditions. There's fucking cockroaches everywhere. Put me on the wing, for fuck's sake. And he, and he goes, you know, he just said it, you know, don't tell anyone because uh, they all want some. And I thought, you fucking prick. But he had all these screws with him and everything. So I wasn't going to do nothing. And then a week later, they put me back on the wing. And, and they sort of laxed the security on me. My mate came and gave me some chickens and some food and all that. And they left the door open. But I didn't realise they were actually doing an inspection this day, you know, uh, from prison inspections. And they, they'd painted all the wing and everything. But they left my door open. For some reason, they left my door open. But in the, in the course of that week, I was back. I was, I was, I was collecting cockroaches. Because I remember sitting there and one of them fell on my face. And I was in because it's a bunk bed. One of them fell on my face in the night. I used to get to this, my sink and they'd come out my cup and they fucking drove me mad. You know, like, it was like, you know, when you've been, I'm living in, in, a, in a lap of luxury now, I'm in a shit old fucking gaff. Um, and there's cockroaches everywhere. So I was, what I did, I started collecting them, put them in a bag. Instead of killing them, I put them in a bag so I could see them. And that sort of stopped me fearing them because I don't know, I got a fear of the creepy crawlies or whatever, yeah. And then I saw the, you know, the, all these people coming down the landing. There's about 16 men, women, and the governor. And I could see him through the crack of my door. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> I remember, I remember he, he stopped right outside my door at the pool table and he was talking some more. <coughs> and um, I sort of thought, fuck it, you know what? That voice came again. And I thought, I'm going to have this cunt, you know what I mean? And so I opened the door, walked up behind him, put the, uh, all the cockroaches over his head. And, <laughs> and he screamed. And then I threw him all over all the women and all the geezers and all that. And, and uh, <coughs> Now, you know, they all started screaming and running and I was actually, I was laughing. I thought, you know what, this mm. is quite funny. And the next thing, all the screws were on me and they gave me a bit of screw retribution mm. and they put me down the block. And then the next day, I got shipped out at one o'clock in the morning. They come and got me, put me down, down uh, the reception and I stayed there all, all till the next morning. <coughs> and I think they took six of us to, uh, to Wandsworth. And then uh, they said, you know what, this guy needs some, like, some help. He needs to go and see a therapist mm -hmm. uh, or a psychologist. So... They, they signed me up to see a psychologist and then uh, this, this lady came and saw me and then for about six or seven weeks um, I started like speaking to her. Was that the first you'd ever spoken yeah, to a never, psychologist? Yeah. yeah, I've never spoken to anyone before. Do you think that saved your life? It was definitely the catalyst that actually helped me. Yeah. Um, you know, for the first time in my life because, you know, I'd normalised, you know, my old man was, a, was an armed robber. Um, got down for a murder as well. Mum was a shoplifter. Everyone I knew was at it. And I normalised criminality. I normalised being in a kid's home. And I know I normalised being abandoned. Because I actually justified my actions by going to a home and working on a, on a farm. And thought, you know what, That's, that wasn't a bad trade-off. I could have stayed in London with all my pals all glue sniffing and doing fuck all. But I was now working on a farm. I got a kid and everything. So I sort of normalised it and said, you know what? I had the better deal. And I convinced myself that was the case. Mm. But while I was speaking about... You know, while I was speaking about it to her, I, I, I started to feel, you know, for the first time ever. I started to understand that um, it did affect me. You know, I, I was, I was, I was deeply wounded, crying a lot. Yeah, I never cried then. I felt it. Yeah. Even now, I feel it. Um, there's something about when you talk about your past, uh, your family, your, your mum, even my brothers and sisters. Well, I don't, I don't really, I don't speak to them. But I blamed everyone. Mm -hmm. It was only when I started speaking. They all, it, I started to realise, you know, I started to, you know, the, the anger started to go a little bit and started to cry. I started to, yeah, I just started to, you know, there, there was feelings I never felt before. Yeah. And, and then I, I blocked it down. I thought, you know what, fuck this. And then I saw her again and again and again over the course of eight or nine weeks. And then I moved, and then uh, we got such, we got on so well that she then mentioned a place called Grendon Underwood to me. Mm -hmm. But in the system, Grendon Underwood is like, it's like full of beasts, you know, like, you know, it's full yeah. of the worst kind of uh, criminal. And, but there was a part of me that actually wanted to find out why I was the way I was, why I was capable of uh, switching off. I know that, you know, for being a father, I'm able to be a really nice father and being caring and everything else is switching off and going to weigh someone in. I'm willing, I, I can go in and be really nice and, you know, mm -hmm. they, 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 graze their knee or something, I can then go out and do an armed robbery. Yeah, it's like your kids, your own kids, you would do anything for them, you would yeah. help them, drop them off at work while the balaclava comes on and you're harming potentially other father's kids, yeah. the grief that causes them, the effect of the trauma that they cause. Because like I say, it's, we, we touch on these jobs, but we've got to think of the victims as well who suffer and probably still suffer as well. Well, you know, you know so for me, that was, that was really what mm -hmm. started to happen. 
you know, I started to, I, I started to find out why I was able to switch off because my mum would be a normal mother and then she would start shoplifting. So there was a link there. There was a link about being abandoned and everything else, why I felt the way I, how I did. Um, so I, I read up on Grendon and I thought, you know what, I want to give it a try. And I was up in Rye all the time then. I was with Terry Adams, Tony Brindle, and we were having a great time up there. You know, we had everything we wanted, you know. I was, with, I was with him for quite a few months and uh, these three old guys I know came there. I've known him for years. I knew him from the cross. I knew him from the Cali. And they were all armed robbers. They've all done 15 years, 20 years. And now they were in their 60s. One of them was actually 70 years old. You know, these are like the Hatton Garden mob, yeah, but different. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sitting there and we was all there having a cup of coffee and, and a laugh and a joke. And they come in there. There was a couple of young kids and they were talking about the job they'd done. And I was, I was sort of, it's, I just felt myself like thinking, fucking hell, you know, are you going to go for eight years of this bollocks and listen to all this again? You know, I saw these young kids looking at these and, and thinking, you know what, I want to be like you. And I'm thinking, you know, and I wanted to say, you know what, why the fuck do you want to be like us? Why the fuck do you want to be like these? You know, spent 25 years in prison already. Now they're going to spend another eight and probably die in prison. And I thought, do you know what, I ain't going to do this no more. And so I told Terry and I told uh, Tony, I'm, you know what, I'm going to fucking go to Grendon. And that's when I got a title for the book. They said, what, Living Amongst the Beasts? Yeah. And I said, do you know what? Everyone's got the perception of this place, but I've read about it. There's mm -hmm. armed robbers there. I remember Razor Smith. I wrote reading about Razor yeah, Smith. No, shout out to Noel. Noel Razor Smith's been on the show. Absolute great guy. His story is amazing. And I yeah. said to Noel, it was probably one of the best podcasts I'd ever done because of what he'd been through, the bank robberies, getting life, losing his son in prison. And then changing his life. Couldn't yeah. read or write, learn how to read and write, right? And now he's writing his own books, publishing companies. I love that shit, man, and that's amazing. I think, I think for me, knowing that he went there mm -hmm. and knowing that he was actually had the, he had the capacity to change, I knew I did. I knew that no matter how, how fucked up my head was and how, mm -hmm. how I was as a, as a person, as a human being, and capable of doing the things I, I could do, mm -hmm. there was always a part of me that I actually, like morally, I was actually, I never hurt women. Yeah. I never hit a woman in my life. I never mess with old people. If I noticed an old person there or a woman there, I wouldn't go nowhere near it. So morally, I, I, was, I was functioning okay. I had a sensibility as far as it never touched kids or, or you know, rob mm. anyone that, you know, apart from what we were doing. So there's a part of me that thought, you know, if Noel can do it, so can I. So I, I signed all the forms and a few months later, they come back and said, you've been accepted. Because yeah. I read your book you sent me a couple of weeks ago. I finished it coming on the way, on the train down today. For a man who, the reputation you have, the people that you know, to be going into Grendon, and the, the, the names and the stories from men uh, raping kids, killing kids, um, serial killers, people killing their mum and dad, the people who are going to meet prostitutes and, and hitting them with hammers. And how was, how was that then for a tough man to, like yourself to have the reputation to be surrounded by these fucking nasty, nasty people? I think, I think for me, it was about making. It was about mindset. Mm -hmm. it, was about, it was about saying, you know what, as much as these people are the most repulsive people you're ever going to meet and they, they've committed some of the most heinous crimes. It's not about them, it's about me. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I'm not a rapist, I'm not a paedophile, I'm not a child killer. So I can't really link in with these sort of people in their mindset. I don't think I ever would. But there was people there that were in for robbery, you know, there were normal murderers and, you know, mainstream prisoners, there were quite a few there. So I knew I would be able to function with them. And if they can do it, Noel can do it, so the fuck could I, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because the first time... You go there, you're, you're met with people, maybe two or three people. You don't really know their story, but you can always tell a shifty fucker. You can always tell someone it's I think, I think not we, quite yeah. right, but when you met them, it's like everyone stands in a circle and you, they're telling you their crimes. Do you know, I've, I've, I found it really hard. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. For me, the hardest thing in the world, being a father, is for someone to stand in front of me and tell me they just killed a kid. Hmm. And that was the first guy I spoke to was, was a guy called Sam. Uh, he... He said that he had, uh, his girlfriend had gone out and he was, he was so angry that she had gone out that when he changed the baby's nappy, his little girl, that he bent her back and he punched her. So he broke her back, her, uh, her, everything. Uh, he punched her, you know, I think she had about 87 bruises and everything on her, you know. And I looked at him, I, you know, I, I've wanted to kill him, you know. But the only thing that I could go back to was the only tools that I had was my sarcasm. And I said, you know what, mate, I understand you. Because I've got girls as well. I've got little girls, and I know how spiteful they can be at six fucking months old. So he just he, he sort of just went white and fucked off. So so for me, using sarcasm was a way of getting through it, you know. But it didn't get any any better because the next guy I met, you know, 
because yeah, it was, it was about owning your owning your offence. You know, there's nowhere to hide in Grendon. You had to say, I was an arm robber. You know, I put my hands up. Uh, and but every time I, I spoke to someone, it just got worse and worse and worse. You know, raping old women. You know, I met a guy. He he, um, he said he met a prostitute, and he bit her tongue off. Um, you know, I was, and and in, you know, I can always remember the one that really stood out for me was a guy called Gavin. He said that he'd split up from his wife. And uh, they were uh, they were going for a divorce, but he decided to kill himself. And um, he started drinking at about one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock, and uh, he started having a pill. And and uh, gradually he was fading. And then his daughter came down. He had two daughters, one nine and one six. And um, she said, "Daddy, Daddy, why are you crying? Why are you upset for?" He said, "I'm going to heaven." And she said, "Daddy, can I come?" And I, I know for me, I, I know. And he he said, "Yeah." And he started giving her a drink and her a fucking pill. And uh, and then he was describing, he was reliving it in front of me. And then he said she didn't pass that, but she she didn't die. So I got a, um, a bag out of the drawer in the kitchen and put it over her head, and she was scraping, you know, my hands and my face. And I thought, God. Bring back a lot of emotions. Yeah. It just shows you how far you've come, though. So it does. It shows you how far you've come. So when you started going through all that and realising, wait a minute, did you ever doubt that you'd made the right choice? I think at that, 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 that particular moment, I was it. Yeah. I remember going to myself, sitting behind the door and think, fucking hell, why are you here? And that's when I sort of justified my... my I sort of justified my criminality with them. I thought, so you know what? There's nowhere in a million years I'm like these fuckers. And then I started saying, you know, I'm a criminal, I'm a, I'm a robber, but I don't hurt people and I don't do this. And I started justifying it. And then I, you know, I, I sort of analysed it and I thought, you know what, he's done this, he's a scumbag. He's a, he's, yeah, I could never do that. But, but I'm, I, you know, it was, it was that not, not for me to walk away and, and then convince myself or justify my whole existence by, by him. You know, you know, why should I, why should this geezer stop me from actually finding out who I was? Mm -hmm. So I wasn't going to blame him. I wasn't going to think I was better than him or anything else. I was just going to fucking put him aside and move on with the therapy. And that's what I did, you know. And the next person I met was even worse. The next person I met was even worse. You know, you got, you know, you got... You know, I was talking to people that, that that took a golf club to their 18-month-old kid and killed them. I was talking to the guys that had... I'd got to put a baby, because I had an argument with his sister, put the kid in a, in a, a pillowcase and smashed the fucking life on the side of the table. And I'm actually doing. Um, so how the fire, fuck, Terry? I mean, if you're going through that therapy and trying to change your mindset, but living next to that, does that is that not like kind of chalk and cheese? It's like you're trying to get help to change yourself, but also listening to these stories where it's going to mentally scar you for life as well. I think what it, I think what it was, and as much as as much as I was going through that full process, I think I had to go through it with them to learn tolerance, because I was never a tolerant person. I could never suffer for anyone, it falls gladly or anything. But I think being with them, you know, gave me tolerance, because you know what, I could have killed them all. Yeah. You know, in fact, someone did kill someone while I was there, so I can, I can understand why he went. There's their moments of, I, I, mm -hmm. I went through them so many times where I wanted to just go in the cell, shut the door and kill them. But, you know, you know, I then had to take on board that I've got, I've got kids. Yeah. I've, my kids because in your book as well, I think, yeah. You're very hard on yourself because you blamed yourself from leaving your kids and doing armed robberies. But then being with these people, it realises, wait a minute, I'm not justifying any crime, but it realises, right, you're not really that bad a guy compared to some other people. Did it give you a wee bit of that mentality that you're not as bad as most people? Yeah, you know, you know the victimology that, that Grendon uh, sort of, you know, churns out on a daily basis that we've all got victims and we're all the same. But the more I went through it, I realised that no, we're not. You know, and I'm not going to be an apologist for that or to anybody. I realised that there is a difference between someone that rapes kids. There is a difference between someone that rapes uh, old women. There is a difference between someone killed killing old kids. You know, I'm not like them. So we, I think we have to change the policy of Grendon simply because you can't group me in the same as them people. How long were you into your sentence, Terry, before you went to Grendon? I was, I was only in there uh, just over a year. You know, I wanted to hit it quick. Yeah. I wanted to do something positive. I didn't want to sit around in the system 
uh, wasting my time going through the same old shit. So what is the system at Grendon? What's the, the policy? What is it you do when you go there? The policy is uh, you sign a compact, you don't hit anyone. You don't use any violence. Um, so what happens is there's a process. You, um, you do an induction course. Uh, and on that induction, three months is a three months uh, induction. Most, most guys I met there lasted a week. One lasted one day. Um, if you get first, first week, second week, third weeks, and you, you see yourself getting through that three months. So there's a little, little things like going into the office and reading a paper in front of a screw. You know, I've never done that before. They was always the enemy. So that process was about humanizing them and getting to know them, to speak to them, and actually instead of calling them gov, calling them by their first name and then calling you by your first name. So over that period, it sort of, it, 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 it seemed to work. Uh, also uh, eating with other people. There was a dining room now. So I spent years and years in prison uh, not speaking to anyone while I was eating. Now I'm on the table with people, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's quite surreal. Um, and for the first time in my life, I actually wrote about how I felt. You know, so I got, a, I gave me a pad and I wrote down how I felt, how I felt about meeting the people, the emotions and, and that evoked in me and, and, and how I wanted to, to do them. And as I read it back over the months, I started to think, I started writing things about my family, my kids and everything else. And for the first time seeing it in black and white, I started to, to understand it. So that, that process of going there and also dealing with boredom for the first time, because you weren't allowed to watch telly in the daytime. You know, you had no television, nothing. You, so when I first got there, there was millions of plants around the fucking place. And I kept wondering, why, why is there so many plants? Why is it so clean here? You know, and then I realised that boredom is, is, is something that I've never been good at. You know, is, is the reason I'd womanise or women I take drugs and everything else. But being there, after a period of time, you start to do things that you wouldn't normally do. I started making cuttings of plants and implanting them. I started cleaning up. And I, cause it was, I was so bored. I started to then talk to people on a level because when you stop talking about crime, when you start, because what happens when you meet criminals is that you, you relate to each other, you, 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 you have alliances because of who you know, the jobs you've done, and you know, in that area. All of a sudden you're actually talking to people, admittedly some of them are, 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 the, are the scum of the fucking earth, but you're actually, you're actually talking to them on a completely different level about their families, about work, about everything, you know, about psychology, about criminality and everything. But you're, the discussions you're having are completely different from, from the criminal side. So over a period of, of that 12 weeks, you then start to develop different social skills. You start working. You start listening to all their crimes and all of a sudden you realise that you can deal with this. There was a few that couldn't and they went back to the system. And I realised that uh, after a few weeks, I, I was capable of actually going to the next level. I thought the next level was going to be a lot easier, but it just got worse. You know, if I thought these guys were the worst of the worst, when I went to the wing, it was just got worse. You know, the things I heard was unbelievable. You How know? did you deal with that? You know what? I just had to turn off. I just had to say to myself, you know what? It's ain't about them. You know, every now and then I would blame them for my behaviour. Yeah. Every now and then I would, I would, uh, I would want to do something to them. But you know what? It was wasn't about them. Now I, I'd gone through that process. I I passed that. This was about finding out who I was. You know, finding yeah. about you know talking about talk. You know, you know sorting about my childhood experiences, the traumas that I went through, and and putting that to bed. You know, because like you know, over that period, I I watched grown men who were really angry. And once they started speaking, that little valve opened and that anger went. Mm -hmm. So then when I, when I saw it working, because I didn't think it worked, you know, of, you know, I went there for all, probably for all the wrong reasons. An easy life, yeah. you know, but as it started to work and I started to engage in it and I saw the things happening, I actually started to get a belief in it. Is it a better, even though you're surrounded by the nonces, is it a better prison? Is it more open and free than the other jails? You know what, it's probably the longest bit of bird you'll do. Yeah, because <laughs> you know you're out all day when you're in a cell you can put the telly on play your playstation yeah, read a book time goes day, like yeah. that yeah. you're out of the cell every day and you've got you got people that are coming to you and telling you how the way you walk the way how's you the talk. suicide and that in there Terry how's the suicide and stuff like that do you know you know I've had, I've had quite a few of my mates commit suicide mm -hmm. over the years uh, in normal prisons um, I think I think uh you know, I remember a, friend, a good friend of mine actually killed himself. Uh, I remember having a cup of tea with him and dinner the, the night before. We was both washing all our clothes because we had a washing machine and all that. This was when I was in a man. And um, he was as good as gold. 
you know, he had a year to go. He'd done, he'd done 18 years. He had a year to go, and he was, he was happy as anything. The next morning, I thought, uh, you know, the alarm went off, and uh, they locked me up. But I was right next to the office, and I, I see the screws come in, and I see the defibrillator go up, and then I saw the ambulance people come, and then the helicopter landed. And then, I, and then uh, the, the intensity of everything just slowed down. And then all of a sudden, I see him come out on a gurney. And that was, that was really terrible, mm -hmm. you know. But you deal with it. I think, you know, there, you know, there are parts of prison that really stick with you. You know, I remember talking to a young kid, 21, just got a life sentence. I was talking to him the night before on a hot plate and saying, to him, you know what, mate, it will get better. You will adjust. You know, we are quite resilient and you evolve in prison. You know, you do get on with it. It doesn't matter where you, what, where you come from. You could be, have a good education, a bad education, rich or poor. Prison is a leveller. You know, everyone's the same. And in a very sp uh, short space of time, you all, you all function on a completely different level. There is an underworld of bollocks that goes on now, and the same as outside here. And you know what? He seemed to perk up, and the next day he was dead. You know, and you know, you, just, you, know, you get to that stage where you just think, you just switch off. You know, you, yeah. you see someone one day. The trouble with prison is that you, you've, you, you meet some real nice guys, you meet some really interesting guys, and you have them sort of relationships, and you talk. You know, the first time ever, you start having social skills that you never thought you had. You have conversations that you never thought you would about your family, about mm -hmm. your kids, about the future, everything else. And all of a sudden, that person's gone the next day. And then all of a sudden, you, you get used to just leave, leave, people leaving you. Yeah. You know, and, and when someone dies, it, it's exactly the same. They, they could be your friend one day and they're dead the next. And then all of a sudden, you just... Yeah, that shit can make you cold. That can make you just go against the system as well and fill you even more hate and rage. Because, let's face it, the system fails you. It's bullshit. There's not many people come out of prison and don't end up back it's only the very few to be blessed to not go back see when you were in Grendon Terry if you if it's only a certain amount of bank robbers and if there's more paedophiles did you ever feel victimised did you ever feel you weren't one of them so we would oh, not yeah. speak to him do you know what for the first you know I did all I don't think it ever changed um, the reason I wrote the book because there was a hierarchy there you know, in most prisons, the, the, the robbers and the, and, and the normal cons rule the roost. But in Grendon, they did. The deviants ruled it, ruled the whole place. And the funny thing about Grendon is that they can vote you out. If they don't like you, you get voted out. So you have, to, you have to sort of start working on a level you never worked before. You have to start making alliances with people you would never even, even dream of talking about, talking to. But the thing I saw most of all is I saw that if your face didn't fit or you didn't walk the right way, talk the right way, you got, they, they voted you out. So I, for me, I felt there was a, a missed opportunity with so many people going through Grendon simply because they wasn't as devious as this mob. They wasn't as deviant. They wasn't as manipulative. And I saw guys who, who I thought really needed the help being voted out for no other reason than they didn't like them. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to expose that. Because I, you know, I do believe that Grendon works on so many levels. I think, you know, the, the, the reoffending rate for an ex Grendon right, right, is exactly the same as anyone in a mainstream prison. That's, that's not in any dispute because if it was the medicine that cured everyone, everyone would be doing therapy. Yeah. Um, but what it, actually, what it actually did is once you dealt with all the childhood traumas and everything else, you actually, had a, had a, had a, you actually felt a bit better. You was less likely, likely to attack someone, attack a member of staff, uh, c uh, commit suicide, self-harm. So there were certain elements of therapy that I thought thoroughly worked. So that set you up to be a better person and gave you the tools to be equipped for getting out. So you then started operating on a completely different level. It set you up more so than people leaving prison. Because mm -hmm. as you just said, the rehabilitation process in, in prison is completely flawed. You know, we have a system in this country that, that, that takes you into a classroom with 10 men. They put a, a pretty girl or a guy there and they put 100 questions on the board. Questions that you ain't got a fucking clue about because you don't live in that world. And all of a sudden they ask you and you tick these boxes and you just answer the hundred questions you ain't got a clue about. And then you spend the next six weeks of them telling you the answers to that, that, them questions. And then, and then they give you another test at the end of it, the same fucking questions. That is classed as a, a successful rehabilitation because at the front of it, you never answered anything. But after those six weeks, you know all the answers. Yeah. So all you do is you memorize it and you move on to the next course. It's just the same course, different name. And nothing ever ha happens. You know, mm -hmm. it's the same in, uh, with the education inside prison. You know, we have guys going in prison and they're really intelligent. You know, they've had, they've had degrees, they've, been to, they've had all the opportunities in life. These are the 60% that go to the education department. These are the 60% that do the, the, co the college and the degrees in there because they're manageable. 
and the 40% that are on the landings doing the jobs that can't read, can't write, or can't do anything, they don't get the opportunity to go to the classroom simply because they, they can't manage these guys. Because of the, it's a private, private uh, provider that actually do all this, everything's done on, on, a, on test, 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 they get accredited for it, and then they, the more they do, so what they do, instead of having a guy that can't read, they then go for the guy that can do it. They put him in front of the test paper, bam, another one done. So they, 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 they've learned in prison that we've got all these guys coming in, they've got education, on all advice. we're going to whack all these guys through. And these guys are going to take advantage of it. Good luck to them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we're missing a golden opportunity to return these 40% back to society and stop that revolving door of recidivism yeah. simply because we're missing that, that one key element is taking the time to actually educate these guys and, you know, cater for their needs, get them a job, educate them, and give them a bit of self-worth. That 40% won't come back in again. Yeah. And the prison population will go down. Because this 60% that keeps going through never come back. It's just this 40% that keeps going mm. back, you know, all the time. Yeah. How long were you in Grindham for? Two years? I was in, I was in uh, just over two and a half years, I think. Just under two and a half years. Is that, uh, is Grindham for, once they think you're better, they release you back into other prison? Or is it when you do something wrong, you're straight back out? Uh, you know, I, I don't think, you know, Grenier has got a policy that you're never, you're never fixed, you're never cured. So that way they absolve themselves of any responsibility. You know, it could be, you could be there two years, three years, four years, five years, six years. If you're there five years, six years, whatever, for me, you just... You're fucked. You know, yeah, because you've heard it all, you've done yeah. it all. And, and basically what you're doing is you, you're living, you're actually having an easy life. You know what I mean? Because you, you're then taking up a position that someone else could have had. But... Mm -hmm. I met mean, lots of guys that had done six years, eight years there, and within a couple of months, they were all nicked again. I came up with five guys that I kept in touch with, you know, murderers and everything else, that had been there five and six years. They're all back inside now. So, you know, you can't gauge someone's success on the an amount of time they do now. Mm -hmm. um, I'd, done, I'd done the time that I felt that I'd, I'd achieved what I wanted to do. I was, I, I was more empathetic. I, I could feel the empathy that towards, towards everybody. I cried at the drop of a hat. You know, every time I thought about my kids, I cried. I thought, you know, and I knew that I was ready. And then all of a sudden, we had an influx from the serious personality disorder units. Mm -hmm. And they were all rapists and they were the worst kind. You know, you, you know, they were coming on. And when you've done therapy, you then have to give something back. That's the, the ethos there. You then have to look after these new guys coming in. And you have to input your, yeah. your, you know, what you've learned. But you know what? You know, six or seven came onto, onto the wing, onto my, onto my group. One of them had raped a, a, a woman in the back of her car. He went, yeah, she, they, yeah she, they, the kids were in the back seat. So I said, how the fuck can they be all white? And then and another one come on that raped a, a woman and a knife point while her kid was in the bed next to her. And I thought, you know what, I can't fucking do this. I, you know what, I've done my therapy. I've learned what I had to do. I've engaged on so many levels here. I'm out of here. So I told my daughter, I'm going to phone you up tomorrow. I'm telling you, I'm writing a book called Living Amongst the Beasts. With that, the security department will here and I'll be out of here by the end of the week. And lo and behold, I said it, that they, they had a commitment uh, the next day for me. You've done it. A commitment actually, it takes about six months to do, but they arranged it overnight. And I went in there and said, listen, I know what this is about. And I said, you know what? I'm writing a book and this is what it's called. And they said, that's quite derogatory, that name. What do you, what do you think, everybody? And I was quite fortunate that one of the guys who chopped up a bird you know, because uh, she stole a bit of coke off him, he chopped her up. And he said, well, I'm a beast. <laughs> I was quite relieved that he said it. And then mm -hmm. someone else said, I'm a monster, I'm a beast, I'm a beast. So I said, well, that really answers the question, doesn't it, really? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The book is accurate. And that's why yeah. I'm, I'm going to write it when I get out of here. And I said, you know what? Vote me out, everyone, because I'm out of here today. The scary thing is, Terry, man, anything you put your mind to, you do it. Yeah. No matter if it's robbing a bank that can't be done, no matter if it's writing a book, no matter if it's saying you're going to change your life, Everything you put your mind to, you do it. And that's the, the beauty of life. Obviously, you can channel your energy down to negative ways, but I understand where you come from. I understand your childhood where your, that was all your mum knew. Maybe that's all her mum knew. They're just passing it down from generation to generation. But the fact that you knew there's something not right here, I want more out of life. The fact that you're willing to put yourself in, in amongst hell to try and learn and educate, because you wouldn't have got that in other system. Never. If you're surrounded with other Torags, you're going to learn from them. You're going to come out and go straight back into other work because when you get out of prison, they just gave you a tent. Is that correct? Yeah, I went to Spring Hill. Yeah. Um, um, I went to, back into the system first of all mm -hmm. when I left there. You know, when I was in Grendon, I didn't realise actually what I was actually learning. It was only when I left there and all the pressure, because you know what, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, pressure on you from everywhere. Yeah. 
it was only when I left there and went to Swaleside that I realised when that pressure was on and I saw all the, the reinforcements. I see everyone's behaviours like in Technicolor. Mm -hmm. I saw everything before it happened, that reinforcement and everything else. Yeah. So it was actually a good thing that I went back there. People's emotions, yeah. sadness, happiness. Everything. Yeah. And I was able to help so many people mm -hmm. by what I learned there. So that was, a, that, was, that was quite a good feeling. But what was it like going back to a normal prison? Do you know what? It was, it was, it was a relief for one to get a grand in. It was also quite daunting because now I was going back to mainstream prison, which is, I remember walking into, into a uh, swell side and the, and the first thing I saw was some guy get jugged with a, uh, with a uh, oil, a mm. uh, mixed race, mixed race guy. And, uh, all his face just peeled off and I thought, fuck me, I'm back now. And then, you know, after a year that I was there and I thought, you know, fucking, I've got to move on. Luckily I was coming to, to, to the time when I was moving, but, just the violence, you know, the violence that goes on now. You know, I can remember... Were you nervous that huh? you were going to get sucked back in and everything that you learned would have went to shit? Do you know what? There was, there was, there was. unfortunately, there was no way I could get sucked back in, simply because I saw it coming. You know, I think once you go through that process, you have a desire to change. I, th I think it's very, it's, it's very hard to get sucked back into it because you actually start seeing it for what it was. Mm -hmm. I can always remember a guy coming to me and said, I know one of your pals. And this is about, about criminal values again. I know one of your pals, really great guy. I'd give my right arm for that fella. And when I got out of prison last time, he took me on a bit of work. I nicked 30 grand in one night. He told me the guy's name, I went lovely. I said, you know what? I'm gonna tell you exactly what happened. He said, I'm gonna say, I, I say, when you got out, he said, I've got a bit of work for you, but I can't do it myself, but I can drive. And this is a normal scumbag routine, yeah. um, parasitic lifestyle it really is. And I told him that and he said, yeah. He said, because I said, I've been there before. You know, if he was your friend, your real friend, he would give you some money after doing 12 years in prison. And then so you can go and see your family. But what he did, he took advantage of you and, and put you on a bit of graft. And fucking two days after you leave in prison, that's not your friend, brother. Yeah. So when you start having these epiphanies about it, you realise that, that I've, I've got some great criminal friends, I'm not going to lie. I love my friends to death. But a criminal code ain't worth a bollocks. You know, there's no such thing as honour amongst thieves. Yeah. There's no such thing as, there's, you know what? We're protecting a belief system that, that really is made up for fucking idiots. Yeah, it's an illusion. It's an illusion, yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So when you got out, when you were going through your transitions, did you feel as if you were changed? Because I'll we'll touch on it. It's one more thing about Grendon. You were singing Christmas carols on stage. Yeah, yeah. How did that feel for being a bank robber, well known to be singing Christmas carols? You were you know, dressed up or anything? You no, know, playing bingo was worse. <laughs> but, uh, I, I was actually playing bingo, which I've never done before. <laughs> I got, you know, one of the ladies come to me and said, Terry, can you do, I was always a bit of a dab around at singing and mm -hmm. I got an opera, opera voice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but what happened, I, um, I got offered to do it and, and I went down there and I started singing and, and you know what is a bit of escapism. I've done, a, I'd also done poetry, um, uh, not poetry, I've done Shakespeare's To Be or Not To Be. The whole thing, a whole sonnet from mm -hmm. memory. And, and it, was just, it was just nice to get up on stage and do something completely different. Mm -hmm. But it also set me up for when I went to, to Stanford Hill. Because when I got there, we, uh, you know, the resettlement prisons are, are not as equipped to deal with, with, with anything. You know, they've got, there's nothing there in, in a resettlement prison. All it is is bang up and all it is is staying on the, on the, on the plot. But I, I was lucky enough to, um, to do a play there, write a play with some guys, and we, we actually went and done the Royal Courts, went and done a play at the Royal Courts. And if, Apart from doing Grendon, this was probably one of the other things that I really, I really enjoyed. You know, to write it with, you know, there's a camaraderie with guys that walk into a room that don't know each other. They're all nervous and everything else. And in the six weeks, they write, they've written a play, they've all bonded together and they've all rehearsed. And we went down to the Royal Court's done it. But that feeling of, of achievement when we came mm -hmm. in, it was nothing, it was something I could never, you know, the only other time I felt it was on a bit of work. Yeah. So I've gone from doing that to actually feeling the same sort of euphoria by doing something positive, mm -hmm. which is great. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's good. So when you get out of prison, they just gave you a blue tent? Yeah, they, you know, we went through the process of, of rehousing, but my, my probation officer said, um, I'm, you know, they promised me the earth and they delivered nothing. Mm -hmm. um, they said that they uh, had a room for me. And then on the, on the last day before I went out, they said, sorry, we, we, uh, we haven't got anything for you. And it could be six weeks, 12 weeks or whatever, but it's down to you now to make your own way. Um, yeah, so, you know, she actually said to me, if you give me the postcode to a bench, we can come visit you. And you know what, after that, I just thought, you know what, yeah, fuck that's them. it, fucking now. Yeah. This is about, I'm going to do it myself. I think it was a kick up the arse I actually needed. 
Um, so, you know, I, um, I got a tent uh, delivered there and uh, I set it up outside the front gate. You know, I, 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 and I said, right, I'm going to stay here. So I got in the tent and I stayed there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I got moved on from the, by the screws. So how was life then after the 16, Terry? Were you ever going to get back into work or were you a completely changed man? Do you know what? You know, when I first come out, I have all intentions of going straight. You know, we, I, you know, I was, I was, you know, and then that life issues come your way. You know, uh, you know, signing on, can't get a job because you've got a criminal record. And all of a sudden, you know, I was, I was, I was that close. And they had nowhere to live. And then, and then my ex-girlfriend put me up at her house. So luck number one. I never had no money. Someone offered me a, a bit of part-time work, doing a bit of painting and decorating. So luck number two. So now I had somewhere to live and a bit of dough. I then went to church and met some really nice people, got baptised. Um, so now I, I sort of changed my, my, my friends. You know, all, all the people at our normal association came down, offered me everything, and I had to turn it back. But now I'd, I'd gone on the path to doing something completely different, you know, something good, something that's going to keep me out of prison. Um, so I, it was about me trying to find something that, that would, would keep me on that straight and narrow. Mm -hmm. but I'm, and unfortunately, there was, um, we had a spat of killings in the area. A couple of young kids got killed from my, from my girlfriend's school. And in the space of a four or five months, we had six kids got killed, three in one weekend, and one of them was a girl. But by this time, we'd set up a Camden Against Violence. And what I was doing is just going around to schools and going around to communities and telling the kids, not, you know, we, sh we shouldn't be feeding into a belief system that protects the, the, the murderers of our kids in this, in this community. There's no honour in stabbing an unarmed person or an unarmed kid. You know, if someone's a paedophile and they're killing your kids, the first thing you're going to do, you're going to name this kid. But when someone stabs our kids in this community, we all fucking go stum. You know, and we protect this because it's, we protect an honor code that only protects them. So I spent my, my last few years teaching people in this area to, mm -hmm. to not believe that system. And, and believe it or not, it's gradually got a lot better. Um, we, we have, we've had marches. Um, I, don't, I was on a crime knife uh, campaign or task force with Keir Starmer. Um, unfortunately, like most white papers, they go into the... Into, into nothing and they fade into the, the nothing and nothing ever happens. But the people have uh, been empowered in the area. You know, there's, uh, there's lots of workshops now for kids. The Camden Against Violence have got their own office and they're giving uh, apprenticeships for the kids. We've got a website where people go on there and offer jobs and cancelling everything for people that have been abused. So you know what, something good came out of what I did after, after leaving there. I then, I then helped start with the Band of Brothers in the area. Um, because I noticed that there was lots of men that isolated themselves. Um, so we brought that to the area. Um, it's an induction weekend. Um, but it's also about men trusting other men. It's only four men. Um, and once you have that trust with each other, and we then ask you to share them life skills with young kids, you know, to try and mentor them and all that, so we put you on courses. So that, mm -hmm. that's going now, that's going really well. And I'm also an ambassador for the, for the Forward Trust. Um, you know, people have got drug problems and that want to change their lives. Um, we direct them to them. They've got jobs. They've got organisations and, and companies that employ ex-offenders, which is really fantastic. Um, because I find that being an ex-offender, even though we, 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 get, we do our sentence, we also get penalised again once we come out. Because as soon as we say we're an ex-offender, we can't get a job. So there's lots of companies now that have, have taken on ex-offenders and realising the potential of them guys that they can work and they do put 120% in more than most people mm -hmm. uh, because they want to prove to everyone that they can move on with their lives. So there's been a lot of success with the Forward yeah. Trust. Yeah, that's amazing, Terry. And that's what I'm saying. All the misery you've been through in your own life, the trauma you've caused, the trauma that you've felt as well, to be helping other kids, to be trying to save lives and try to get people jobs. And that's amazing, man. You should be proud, very proud. Yeah. Um, because it takes courage and guts to change. It takes courage and guts to be a bigger man and say, wait a minute, I've fucked up. I'm sorry. I want to change. That takes so much courage because people talk. Everybody talks and it's a lot of shit. Just people talk. No many people have put it into action to actually make the sacrifices and the changes. So I take my hat off to you for that, brother. I think I, think, uh, I said I, 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 I went and met um, someone who's a, who's a born again Christian. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, there's, there's a couple of words. You know, if you give yourself over, you know, and I always remember words, come to me and let me do the rest. Mm -hmm. And I'm I baptised. But since then, 
and doing therapy and doing the, the work I do. I, my, my film, not my life, is so much freer, and I'm happy to do the things. So I, the amount of effort I used to put into criminality was 24 hours a day. The amount of effort I put into what I do now is 24 hours a day, but the rewards are so much better. Yeah. We've now got a company called Scoff Mills with my daughter and her boyfriend. We do nutritious field uh, for the for gyms and people that want to change their lives nutritiously and everything else. But we uh, we started that about 18 months ago and it was going really well. And unfortunately we had the coronavirus started so we had to shut it down. But instead of just sitting back, you know, I, I was going driving around and I kept seeing all the homeless people and I, and, and I was reading on the, looking on the telly and all I kept seeing was like, we were asking them all the homeless. And I thought, no you ain't, there's loads of homeless people around here. Yeah. So I got in touch with uh, Vicky Patterson and Geordie Shaw. My daughter's a good friend of ours. Uh, and then we phoned up all the, the companies, uh, Ovis, uh, all loads of them, loads of different companies. I won't mention all their names. But you know what? They all donated, you know, everything, of soups, yeah. milk, everything, bread and everything. I then went to a, uh, a company called Yahaya and I met the guy down, a really lovely fella. He's got 25,000 square feet of warehouse. And he said, listen, you can have the warehouse and, and you can do the, the, the packages and make packages up for all the people in the area if you want. So we assumed that we was going to get a bit of gear that was going to last one week and we're going to go and feed the homeless and everything else. Mm -hmm. But we got so much gear, we practically got a warehouse full of food. And over this 10-week period, we've managed to do 10,000 care packages for the Age, uh, Age uh, UK, um, the food banks and the homeless. We've actually been giving them to the homeless. Do you know how rewarding that is? Yeah, it's the best feeling in the you world. Know, I, I have, you know, I have, I've been giving to the same people for, for the last 10 weeks. And just meeting old, you know, I've been knocking on old people. One guy was 100 years old, he couldn't get out. And a, girl, a, a, a lady mm. phoned me up and said, tell, I, got, I, put on, I put it out on Twitter. And she, she said, I've got this old guy living down in Camden Town. He can't get out. I said, listen, don't, don't worry, I'll go down there. And I knocked on his door. It took about 15 minutes to open the door. And I gave him this care package. And every week I'll give him the next one, the next one, the next one. That was so rewarding, it was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. you know? And then to see the people on... Uh, in the food banks, uh, single mothers were going down there who, who never had nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just, you know, for me, it was so rewarding. It was backbreaking yeah. doing them, but yeah. from what we achieved over them 10 weeks, mm. adds doing something productive and giving something back to the community after taking for so long. Yeah. You know, you couldn't buy it. Yeah, it's in our piece and as cheesy as it is, the best things in life. If you can mm -hmm. help someone that can't help you back, then you can't buy that shit. And, and that's why it, we do the stuff that we do in Glasgow. Even though we're helping others, it's me it benefits. So it's me it's rewarding to doing the suicide stuff, the homeless stuff, because helping other people that you can't, it's a gift of life to try and help others. And, and no matter how much you steal or how big your house is, all that shit is irrelevant. Do you know what I mean? If you're helping someone else, that there is the currency and the availability that you'll never, you can never buy anywhere. Do you know, for me as well, I think it's also a way of reinforcing what I've done. Mm -hmm. So the more I do, it's sort of, it's like topping up a car. Mm -hmm. The more I do, I keep topped up. Yeah. The minute I goes down and down and down and down, yeah. so I ain't doing nothing good, is the minute I'm gonna go back to that life. Yeah. So I'm gonna continue to do good. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna continue to just help people. You know, I do gardening for people now. Yeah. I don't get paid for none of this, but you know what? The reward is so, you know, I can't even describe yeah. how I feel. It's like peace you know? as well, Terry. Yeah. And it's karma, karma wins. So all the time, even though I interview a lot of criminals, and like I say, we hate authority, we hate the police, but Cameron always wins. They'll say, oh, that bastard set me up and I get 15 years, but they already got away with 20, other, 20 30 other jobs. Do you know what I mean? So it's, This is what it is. We have a, we have a, a yeah. sense of fair play. You mm -hmm. know, we, we, we take and take and take and take, and the minute we get caught, we feel our done by. Mm -hmm. Do you know what? I can understand most of the guys that I've, I've worked with over the years because of the way we've grown up and, and we learn from our parents. So, you know, if, if, if the persons that are adults and the people that you respect are the people that are showing you how to do this, you don't go any other way. You know, most, most, most kids that are 11 years old, 12 years old, they get to that age and they've got a father figure there. And that father says, you know, listen, from today, you don't hit J Jonathan or Peter or whatever. You know, you must talk. And, you know, and you've got to go to college and you've got to go to university and you grow as a human being. You grow, you get, you get civility, you get empathy, you get social skills. Unfortunately, in our world, is that when you're when you're wrong, you're right because you got violence and this. You know, you've got no one to teach you anything apart from the wrong way. 
So you then hang around with people that are feral like yourself and we create our own rules and regulations and laws and we, we live by that. Unfortunately, we need to, we need to educate people. I, I still know guys that are 50 years old taking cocaine and Charlie yeah. and womanizing and everything else. And, and I, you, know, you know, since I've been out four years, I tried to explain to them about their lifestyle and everything else and they'll go, fuck it. You know, like, yeah. you, know, uh, you know what, I'm all right. Do you know, I think I've had four of my mates die since I've come out. They've got a lot of attacks. They've had, they're in, some of them were in the coma for a few weeks. And it only takes, you know, something like a, um, something in your life to catalyst. So yeah. mine was going to prison. So, mm-hmm. so to turn my life around, I don't drink or smoke or do anything yeah. no more. Unfortunately, they're 50 and 60 years old doing all this and they have to have an heart attack before they wake up. By that time, it's too late. Yeah. Because now they they can't they can't function properly, and you know and so for me, why I wrote the book was actually trying to empower my friends, mm-hmm. empower my empower my family. Yeah. You know, and just empower everyone to actually start looking mm-hmm. at their behaviours and then try and get that transition period from a puberty as a less adolescent yeah. to actually come into being a, a man or or a, or a woman. Yeah, but a lot yeah. of people are in denial, Terry. It's like if someone came to you fifteen years ago, you'd have told them to fuck off. So. It's just because we know how good it feels to wake up early, to have some meaning, to have some purpose, to go and help others, to create something. Like, I do this show and I love this. This is therapy for me. Speaking to you is yeah. therapy for me. Yeah. Other people who's watching who realise, because I've done the drugs, the drink, the gambling, the, the womanising, done it all the bullshit. But when you start feeling better, when you kind of put all that shit to the side, when you start telling other people, they go, he's fucking forgot himself. He, he's crazy. More people thought I was going more crazy because I was going to do a spiritual route Same when yeah. I was actually a fucking mad coke kid and womanizer. They thought I was worse because mm. I was talking about spirituality and re- energies and frequencies and reading books called The Power of Now and You Can Heal Your Life. I was watching Tony Robbins and people were like, he's fucking losing his mind. But look where you are now. Yeah, exactly. But again, we can, some, I don't like to, I always try and plant little seeds in friends' heads or, because I don't want to preach because it just pushes him away. Do you know what I mean? Where they go, he's fucking forgot himself. Or, I think you've got to lead by example. Yeah, I think so. Actions yeah. speak louder than words and you're doing it as well as myself to create change. And that that's what leaves a legacy. That's where people stand up and then they make feel embarrassed and go, fuck him. But two or three years later down the line... Like, We're going to see him all there. Yeah. You know, and I do every... I, you know, so I, still, I still see. Do you know what? The guys that I spoke about, Terry and Tony and all them guys, I still see them all. Mm-hmm. You know what? They've all moved on. They've all changed in their lives. They're all doing good things now. You know, and not one of them has ever said to me about going to Grendon. No one has ever come to me and said, you know what you did was fucking bad. Yeah. You know, they've all said, what you did, I could never do. Mm-hmm. What you did putting up with this mob, you must be fucking crazy for mm-hmm. one. And you must have a constitution like no one's business. I went through hell there, but you know what? There was a massive light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Coming through that tunnel, so the light was brilliant. Yeah. Just getting back to what you said, it's a hard decision for everyone who's in the criminal world to change, simply because I can remember sitting on the beach in my bar and, and this guy came along with, he was, he was at a plaque and a, or a board on his thing saying, Jesus loves you, change and repent. And we like, we were the nouveau riche. We had loads of money. I would never change when I had that. There's nothing would have dragged me to go to where that guy is, but now I'm where he is. So how do we change the mindset the new Roshi's criminal that have got everything to actually coming over to here. Mm-hmm. That's the, yeah. the million dollar question. But again, I think it sounds crazy for people watching, but some people are chosen, I think, to go to the dark places. Now, if you never went through all your darkness as a kid, the trauma, the pain, homes, prison, you wouldn't be where you are now to help other people. So sometimes, I always say it, sometimes you need to go to the darkest places to find your light. You went through hell. Grendon sounds like hell for me. To be there, you've went through the fire, the pits of hell, to be risen to who you are today, to be helping others, doing homeless work, helping abused abused women, getting people homes, writing books. That shit is special. And I always tell people, you must thank the past or else you only learn for your trauma. You know, I've, I've had this conversation, you know, people said, if you, had to, if you had to do it all again, would you do the same thing again? Of course mm-hmm. I would. Yeah. Do you know what? I've got five beautiful kids. Mm-hmm. I've got 11 grandkids. I've got a beautiful dog and a beautiful girlfriend. <laughs> um, do you know what? I've had a really ch- checkered life, but you know what? The experiences that I've had, you know, and I continue to change people's lives by what mm-hmm. I'm saying and, and, the, and the talks that I'm doing. You know, we always said, if you can change one life, then it's, all, it's, it's worth yeah. it. But you know what? We continue to change lives every day from what we do. Yeah. So you know what? I'm going to continue to change lives. I'm going to continue on the same vein as I am now. And I'm mm-hmm. going to continue to not defend the belief system that is going to 
kill our kids. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. Yeah, I'm, fair play. Yeah. Where can people get your book, Terry? Um, the book's on Amazon. Um, there's a little, little story. The prisons are actually banning this book mm-hmm. because it's called Living Amongst the Beasts. They've actually t- told me that the content is, 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 is okay. It's actually a learning book. It's not something that's actually uh, decrying the prison system or uh, the people in Grendon because, I, I, as I said, I can't function on their level, so I'm not going to have an opinion on them. But I do believe it changes. So we've got Living Amongst the Beasts. is out on Amazon and on Kindle Unlimited. But I'm also releasing another book this week. The same content as that, but it's going to called it's called the Grendon Grendon's Therapy: The Inside Story. It's going to be on Amazon. It should be out released on on Monday this Monday. Mm-hmm. Perfect. We will leave all the links for that. Your yeah. social media as well, Terry. I know you're on Twitter. Yeah, it's uh, Terry Ellis nine nine two. Facebook or anything? Is that uh, your prison number? No, we well, you know what. Yeah, there's a link to that. Yeah. Is that? Yeah, I always remember what my prison number. Yeah, same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is um. Have you got Facebook or anything? Uh, just Terry Ellis. Uh, I've also got a, a, a book club. What I've been doing is because we, you know, we sold over a thousand copies in the last mm-hmm. month, which is unheard of for, for for self-publishers. So, the book has gone well, uh, word, word, word of mouth. Um, the response to it has been overwhelming for me, simply because it's empowered lots of women. Believe it or not, mm-hmm. women that have, that have got in contact with me and say it's empowered them to to report their abusers. It's it's empowered them to write books. It's empowered them to start talking about it, and men as well. We've had mm-hmm. quite a lot of men. But the book site, the, uh, the, the Facebook site is is called um, Living Amongst the Beasts, so Your Views Matter. And everyone who's bought the book, and I've got celebrities on there, everyone, and they're, they're, they're sending their pictures in with the book, mm-hmm. and they're telling me exactly what they thought of it and what they're getting out of it. Yeah. People are expecting me to, to lambast it and, and decry the therapy. But if something works, I can only, I can only champion it. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, I honestly think therapy works, but it's not the medicine that cures the deviance. Mm. And if it's in your nature, it's not going to happen. It's not the med- it's not the medicine for uh, for rehabilitation, but it definitely helps you move forward with your life. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, fair play. Just before we finish up, see before you got your sixteen, Terry, did you make a deal or did you take it through trial? Um, um, I never done a deal. Um, they offered me a Newton earring, and I thought, as I said, my mate's got tens and elevens. Uh-huh. I went on a Newton earring, they offered me twenty three. Um, and I said, well, you know what? If I go guilty, surely you got to give me the same as him or less. You know, mm-hmm. I got to get a third off. And they said no, because you're the ringleader. So I thought I'd, I'd I'd beat them on an appeal because if they give me sixteen or twenty three, I'll beat them on the appeal because of the dis- disparity. Yeah. But unfortunately, the word went in, and what they did, they gave me a nine, and then they topped it up with a consec. So I couldn't, I got less than my friends mm-hmm. and then they topped it up with another one. So, you know what? I couldn't yeah. win. I couldn't appeal it. But you know what? As much as I, I felt uh, aggrieved by it, I've never had the opportunity to, to write the book, experience Grendon and meet the people that I've met. So, you know what? In some sadistic sort of way, mm-hmm. it's actually probably one of the best Changed things ever life. Yeah. Are you out license? I'm out to, I'm licensed to 2025. Mm. That's, at least you're out, mate. Do you know, statistically, I should be back in prison. Mm-hmm. You know, for years and years, for as long as I can remember, I was uh, a statistic. Um, I didn't realise at the time though, yeah. Um, I thought I was different from everyone else. Um, I thought I was untouchable. I lived above the laws that most people live by, you know. But statistically, I should be back in prison, but I'm happy. I'm living a drug-free life now. Mm-hmm. Um, got a lovely girlfriend, um, lovely home. Um, in spite of a system really that sets men like me up to fail Mm -hmm. Um, but the only thing the difference is and if I was going to give it everyone in prison and everyone out there if you've got the desire to change regardless of who's around you you will change you know what you need to stand up and be counted you know you need to you need to be different from everyone else you Mm -hmm. need to you need to just come away from it you know because there's only one one way you're going to go you're going to die or you're going to go to prison you're going to get stabbed you're going to get shot Yeah. you know and when you see it happen time and time again to your friends and I try to tell people this is what your life is going to be like why do you want to aspire to 20 years in prison mm-hmm. so so that's my message yeah. you know just change your life have the desire to do it yeah fair play your brother because we spoke earlier it is a lonely journey change but people need to understand no one is coming to chap your door and hold your hand to save you not your mum not your dad no not your brother your sister no one you need to dig deep and make the changes there's people out there you can get inspiration from including yourself and it shows that people can change, but it takes hard work. It takes a bit of sacrifice and it takes a bit of courage to make the effort, but it can be done. And that's the beauty of life, Terry. And you know, I think everyone's got the capacity to change. Yeah. 
you know, all you got to do is have the desire to do it. Mm-hmm. Would you like to finish up on anything else, Terry? Uh, do you know, I've, uh, I think I've, I've said it, uh, about as much as I can say. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, I think if you want to move forward in your life and you want to create a better future of yourself, um, lots of people I know that come out of prison, yeah, they move to a different area because they think their life is going to change. Like, you know, they get different relationships. And they think it's like everything's going to change because I've gone here or I've moved 100 miles away. But you know what? Nothing ever changes. You have to deal with what's in here and you have to deal with what's in here before you can move on. Because once you do that, you can live anywhere. But until you fix the problems inside, you're just going to move the problem from there to there to there. So for me, the advice I'd like to give to everyone is just start talking about your traumas in life, your relationships, your interpersonal relationships. Because once you deal with them and you, can't, you, know, you put them to the side, they're never going to go away, but they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna get a lot easier to deal with. You want it to self-medicate. You want it to, to get angry. You know? So for me, if you can deal with them and move forward, that's what you need to do. So mm-hmm. talking, 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 and, this, and, and yeah. hopefully giving yourself yeah. a better opportunity in life. Yeah. Listen, Terry, it's been an absolute pleasure for inviting me into your home, telling your story. Your book was a fantastic read. Look Thank forward you. to the second one. Um, all the best for the future, brother. And I you, look brother. forward to seeing your Thank journey. You, James. Thank I really you, God it, bless. Yeah. Thank you.